Chapter 252 Halal Rape vs. Haram Rape, Part 12 Hassan, Mu'alan Ashik Marzoak, Mustafa, Fata, and other three tough guys sat in one corner of the Sharia court. On the other corner sat quietly Intisar, Sami, Salah, Mona, Walid, Badaria, and Intisar's mother. Some few unknown people are scattered here and there. Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin Taha delayed his coming for an hour. It is very long waiting for the concerned parties. At 11.30 am, the courtman announced the arrival of the virtuous Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin Taha. His jury came an hour earlier to him. When the virtuous Mu'alana entered the courtroom everybody stood on his feet. His honor is wearing a white pajama, turban, and shawl. In his right hand he is holding a grey colour prayer beads and on his left hand a green colour copy of the Quran. Before he sat, his eyes surveyed the audience for a while. When he sat the rest of the people sat after him. He turned to his right and whispered some secret words in the ears of the Mu'alana sitting near him. After the whispering is over the two Mu'alanas laughed happily. After that he lifted up his hand and the whole court is dead silence. A courtman stood before the virtuous Mu'alanas and read loudly the following charge sheet. The virtuous Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin Taha and his reverend jury, Mr. Hassan Majub al-Halali brings before you a complaint against his lawful wife Intisar Ibrahim Mustafa Gabir. The said wife has refused to live with him and attached herself to another man by the name of Sami Osman al-Taib. This man has no any blood relationship with Intisar except that he claims to be her lover and fiancé. Hassan seeks your justice according to the wisdom and knowledge that the great Allah has entrusted you with. When the above charge sheet is read some of the accused raised their hands and voices in objection, but Mu'alana took his stick and stroked the table violently. The noise died away quickly. The courtman came forward and announced loudly the name of Sami Osman al-Taib. Sami stood up and walked toward the courtman. When he reached him, the courtman took his oath. Are you the said Sami Osman al-Taib? asks Mu'alana loudly. Yes I am, replies Sami. Have you encouraged Intisar Ibrahim Mustafa Gabar to leave her husband Hassan Majub al-Halali and attach herself to you? The question is wrong I will not answer it. Answer yes or no, shouts Mu'alana. Intisar is not married to Hassan. She is my fiancé. I didn't ask you to tell us that. My question again have you encouraged Intisar to leave her husband Hassan and attach herself to you? This is false claim and false accusation. Thank you sir. Will you please go to your seat? The courtman called out the name of Intisar and asked her to come forward. Sami refused to move from his place. The courtman asked him to go to his place but Sami didn't respond. The courtman tried to push him but Sami pushed him back. Mu'alana waved his hands to some policemen. Five of them came running toward Sami and without talking to him they just carried him on their shoulders and took him out of the courtroom. After five minutes they returned back without Sami. The courtman called the name of Intisar three times but she didn't come forward. Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin Taha pointed his hand toward her. Two huge policewomen stood up and walked toward Intisar. Salah understood their intention and stood too and went to Intisar and whispered in her ears. Intisar responded to his advice and walked out of her seat. Mona and Badaria took Intisar's hands and led her forward. Followed behind them are the two policewomen. When they reached the courtman the policewomen returned to their seats. Will you please put your right hand on the Holy Quran, says the courtman. Intisar is reluctant to do so but Mona took her hand and placed on the Quran. Please repeat after me says the courtman, I swear by the great Allah that I will say the truth all the truth and nothing but the truth. Intisar didn't repeat the oath instead she continued to weep and shed tears. The courtman repeated his request but Intisar didn't respond. The courtman and everybody in the court hall looked expectantly to Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin Taha. At least, says Mu'alana Abdul Mohsin, in reverence to Allah and his gracious book say the oath. 
Intisar didn't respond to his words but continued to weep and pour out her tears. Well, at least tell us why don't you want to live with your husband Hassan? Because he is not my husband, screams Intisar, and I hate him. I hate him more than anyone in this world except you. I hate you more because you have killed my sister and brother. You are a murderer. You supported and encouraged the kidnap, rape, and murder of my sister Firdaus. You are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You supposed to be judged and condemned for murdering an innocent girl as my sister. While she is screaming out those words Intisar is pointing her finger at Mualana Abdul Mohsen Taha. Everybody in the court is astonished by her courage and boldness. Most of the audience stood on their feet. Some had put their hands on their mouths and heads. Intisar turned to Hassan and pointed her finger to him. I challenge you and this corrupted judge that you dare touch me. Guards, shouts Mualana Abdul Mohsen take this accursed girl and throw her out of this courtroom. In response to his order, the two huge policewomen ran to Intisar and dragged her by her shoulders out of the court hall. Intisar's mother, Mona, Badaria, and Walid followed them. Salah alone is left behind. Mualana Abdul Mohsen Taha is very much annoyed by Intisar's words. He is breathing with difficulty for some times. The policewomen took Intisar out of the court and prevented her from coming in. This is the result of the wrong upbringing, says Mualana. This is the outcome of allowing women to choose their husbands. A filthy girl as this one challenges the court of Allah. I swear by Allah if she is my daughter I will have broken her neck. Allah, says another Mualana, don't punish us for what the wicked among us have done. The courtman came forward again and announced the name of Hassan Majub al-Halali. When Hassan came he took his oath. Can you tell the court why your wife refused to live with you? Asks Mualana. Because she doesn't love me. Do you love her? Yes I do. Are you physically fit to have a normal marriage life? Yes I do. Do you have money to support your wife? Yes I have. Thank you Mr. Hassan. You can now go to your seat. When Mualana ended his interview with Hassan, he saw Salah put his hand up. Please put your hand down. We don't allow anyone to advise us in this court. I don't want to advise the court, but I want to tell the truth regarding the marriage in question. Keep your truth to yourself. The marriage contract is a false contract. You can't pass a judgment on the contract unless it is valid. Who are you to decide on the validity of the marriage's contract? Besides that are you related to the girl? I am a lawyer and I know the girl and her family. We don't accept lawyers in this court and if you have any objection refer it to the Ministry of Justice. Can you allow me to narrate to the court the history of Intisar and her sister Firdaz and their struggle with Hassan and his friends? Not in this court. Please sit down and keep your advices and stories to yourself. When Salah sat down Mualana Abdul Mohsen started to consult his jury. After some whispering he came out with his judgment. In the name of Allah, says Mualana, the most merciful and the most compassionate. After carefully examining the dispute between Mr. Hassan Mashab al-Halali with his lawful wife Intisar Ibrahim Mustafa Gabar, this court has decided to pass the obedience sentence on the wife. The obedience sentence must be executed on Intisar Ibrahim Mustafa Gabar within 24 hours. If any member of wife's family or relative or friend tries to hinder the police from transferring her to her husband's house he or she will be imprisoned with five years. The said Sami Osman al Taib is sentenced to a month imprisonment starting from today. Court, shouts the courtman. When the court is over, no one is so disturbed and troubled in his heart than Salah. His conscience troubled him the more. For he held himself responsible of what had happened to Sami and Intisar. When Sami and Intisar received the two court's invitation letters, they decided to run away, but Salah hindered them. He convinced them that by running away they will prove to the court that they are guilty. He advised them to attend the trial and fight their case. 
He further told them he will bring the case before the High Court if the Sharia Court condemn them. But, after the trial is over all his expectations are disappointed. He knew that Sami is in prison. Intisar will be taken by force to Hassan's house within 24 hours. If he should try to hinder the policeman he will be held responsible for breaking the law. In that case, he will be charged of five years imprisonment. He is in serious dilemma. When everybody left the court Salah remained sitting on his seat and putting his hands on his head. After some times, Walid approached him and requested him to come out of the court hall. He stood up and let Walid to lead him by the hand. When he reached out he found Intisar is still weeping and surrounded by her mother, Mona, Badaria, and some unknown people. Walid stopped two taxis and gave their drivers Intisar's address. When the friends reached Intisar's house they started to discuss the issue seriously. What can we do for Intisar? asks Mona. I think we are helpless, says Walid. You mean we have to give up and let those policemen come and take her by force to Hassan's house, says Badaria. Well, can we defy the law, says Walid. I didn't mean to say that, says Badaria. Any attempt to help her will put us against the law, says Walid. Even if we give up I don't think Intisar will give up, says Mona. I think we must hide Intisar somewhere until Sami comes out of jail. After that, the two friends can run away to another city, says Badaria. That is what I thought of, says Mona, but I think Hassan has hired some spies to watch over Intisar until the policemen come. You are right, says Walid, I saw them at the court and when we took the taxis they followed us. Must probably they will be standing outside watching Intisar's movements says Mona. While the friends are discussing the serious issue, Intisar is weeping in her bedroom. Salah is sitting quite all this time. When he understood that the friends had given up hope, he requested them to go to their houses and leave him with Intisar. The three spies remain standing near Intisar's house. They are very carefully watching the house. They saw two girls and one boy left the house. They knew none of the girls is Intisar. They are instructed to watch Intisar's movement only. So, they didn't bother to follow those who left the house. They understood that one of the two boys still in Intisar's house. From 12.30 p.m., until 10 p.m., they continued to watch the house. They concluded that neither Intisar nor the boy will leave the house. As they are instructed they kept watching the house. For they are told to keep an eye on Intisar until the policemen come on the next day morning to take her to her husband Hassan. At 10 p.m., they saw suddenly the door is opened and a young boy came out. At first they thought he might be the boy who remained behind. But when he came close to them they realized he is not the boy. They are told that there is no any man in Intisar's house. They are very much concerned about the new boy. The leader found himself in difficult situation. He had to decide whether to follow the boy or just to ignore him. While he is still reasoning in his mind he saw the boy stopped a taxi and entered in. The taxi moved immediately. The leader ordered one of his two men to follow the boy. Another taxi is stopped and followed behind the first driver. After the two taxis went into car race the leader took out his cell phone and called Mustafa's number. Hello sir. Yes Duma speaking, yes sir everything is in control, she is still in the house, all had left except one boy still with her, sir we have faced small problem, not very serious. A young boy had just left her house, we have not seen him before, he took a taxi and headed towards the main street, are you sure there is no such a boy in the house, yes Al Algajir went on his tail. I have not yet received a call from him. Don't worry Algajir will not lose him, I will let you know as soon as he calls. Bye sir. When the leader disconnected the line he began to recollect his memory of the new boy. But the boy's image didn't confirm his suspicion. He concluded that the boy can't be a girl in disguise. The other spy also agreed with his leader's conclusion. 
After an hour the door opened again and another boy stepped out. He is carrying a small bag. The leader recognized the boy to be the same one who came with Intisar and her friends. When the boy stopped a taxi the leader ordered his man to follow him too. The two taxis went on the same direction chasing each other. Duma remained alone standing on the road waiting for a call from his two men. In his heart he is strongly believing that Intisar still inside the house. After an hour and a half he received a call from Al Gijir. Yes Gijir. Please speak loud, I am not hearing you properly, there is lot of noise in your side, highway, what is he doing there, keep an eye on him, never let him shakes you off, Mustafa said there is no other boy in the house, he is in the shacks. Do you think he is planning to travel somewhere? continue to watch him and if he jumps in a car don't hesitate to follow him, yes even if you have to travel after him to Khartoum or Port Sudan, bye. The leader Duma remained standing on the road alone. He is tempted to break in Inti Sar's house and find whether she is still there. Somehow he gave up the idea. After few minutes he received a call again from Al Gijir. Yes Gijir, Al Genie with you, the second boy joined the first boy. Call me after two minutes. When Duma disconnected the line he called Mustafa immediately. Yes Duma speaking, the other boy left in a taxi too, yes I sent Genie after him, Gijir just called and said the two boys are sitting in the shacks on the highway, most probably they are planning to travel out of the city, you want me to go there, but suppose it is just a trick to deceive us. Maybe they want us to leave the house and go after them. In that case she will be able to escape safely. Yes I can find out whether she is still there or not, don't worry I can do that without any problem, ok, I will call you after 10 minutes. After the above phone conversation Duma crossed the road and stood before Intisar's house. He took out of his pocket a punch of keys. He looked carefully at the door keys hole and selected one key and inserted in. The door at once sprang open. He walked in as if he is entering his own house. He searched all the rooms. He found only Intisar's mother fast sleeping. He sat in one room and made a call to Mustafa. Yes this Duma. She is not in the house, don't worry my men are following them, yes I am going there too. Yes sir I will call you from there, bye. After that, Duma lighted a cigarette and changed the position of his legs. In fact he is sitting on Intisar's bedroom. He dialed Al Gijir's number. Hello Gijir, what, you are traveling on a lorry, Genie with you too, where are you heading to, the two boys in the same lorry, never leave them to shake you off, let me call Mustafa. Hello sir, your boys are traveling on a lorry going to Kassala, yes both of them in the same lorry, yes I told them, you think they are in the right track, excellent. 20 minutes, must probably they will reach Kassala at 1.30 p.m., yes I will keep informing you, bye. At the beginning of the trip, Intisar and Salah are not aware that they are followed. They sat silently on the top of the grain sacks. After an hour all passengers fell asleep except two. Intisar is disguising herself as a boy. No one noticed that because she cut her long hair and put a cap. She is wearing a trouser and a shirt a thing which is very rare for a girl to do in that part of the world. She spoke very seldom with Salah and in whisper. She hid her face on her knees most of the time. Moreover, it is a moonless and dark night. The lorry is travelling very slowly. Intisar and Salah are engrossed in deep thoughts. The other two passengers also talk to each other in whisper. They are smoking continuously. Salah noticed that they are facing them all the time. Even though he suspected that they might be following them but kept it from Intisar. He decided to find out whether they are following them. Before the lorry reached Al Shawak he began to whisper to Intisar. Intisar, says Salah, do you feel sleepy? No, replies Intisar. This lorry's speed is very slow. What about changing it on the next stop? I think that is a good idea. 
When the lorry reached Al Shawak after an hour journey, Salah and Intisar sat in one of the highway food shacks. The two passengers too sat in the same shack and ordered two cups of tea. None of the other passengers got down. After twenty minutes' break, the conductor told Intisar and Salah and the two passengers to climb on the lorry. Salah and Intisar went to the driver and pretended to be talking to him. Meanwhile, the other two passengers climbed up. They lighted their cigarettes and waited for Salah and Intisar to come up. They are disappointed when the lorry began to move without the two boys. Chief, shouts Al Gijir in his cell phone, they shook us off. We can't get them now. They have already climbed another lorry going to the opposite direction, you can do that, yes their lorry is going towards Al Ghadarif, you can intercept them at the highway shacks, most probably an hour or maybe less, yes we got down, yes we will take another lorry, but they will reach before us, just check every lorry comes to the shacks, definitely you will see them, bye. Duma sat for one hour at Al Ghadarif highway shacks and checked every lorry came from the east. But he didn't see the two boys. What trouble him are those drivers who just passed by without stopping. After another fifteen minutes, he jumped in a lorry and headed towards Khartoum. When Al Ghajir and Al Jini reached Al Ghadarif shacks, their leader is also gone missing. From the time the lorry passed by Al Ghadarif shacks without stopping, Salah and Intisar are debating upon one matter. According to Intisar, Salah should get down at Al Fayo town and leave her to continue the journey alone. She is arguing that, Salah will put himself in trouble if the spies prove to the court that he assisted her in escaping. Salah is not agreeing that she should go to Khartoum all alone. She is not having enough money and she didn't know anybody there. Eventually, she convinced him that the money she is having will be enough to keep her in a hotel for few a days. When he can not able to convince her, Salah agreed to go back but he promised to come shortly to her at Khartoum. At 3.30 p.m., Salah and Intisar reached Al Fayo. Salah got down and took another lorry going back to Al Ghadarif. Intisar continued her trip to Khartoum alone. It had been a difficult night for Salah. When he reached his house it is 7.30 a.m. He went directly to his bed. He is so tired that he didn't bother to change his clothes. He fell asleep immediately. He is shook out of his deep sleep later that day by three policemen. When he opened his eyes he saw the policemen standing before him. Are you Salah Hassan Salah? asks one of three cops. Yes sir, replies Salah. You are under arrest. Why am I under arrest? You are accused of helping Intisar Ibrahim Mustafa Gabber to run away from the law and her husband.